Welcome to the Hockey Writers Maple Leafs Lounge, a weekly show from our Toronto Maple Leafs writing crew, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, prospects, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from draft day to the trade deadline, our team covers everything that happens with the blue and white. Come on in and pull up a chair. Welcome to the Maple Leafs Lounge. Hello and welcome back to the Maple Leafs Lounge. I am your host, Peter Barracchini. And as always, I'm joined by my colleague over at the Hockey Writers, Alex Hobson. Again, fellow Maple Leafs uh, writer over there. Alex, buddy, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm just uh, waiting for things to get back into uh, sort of the swing of things in terms of the Leafs and um, looking ahead to a couple of exciting storylines on, on Tuesday night against the Dallas Stars. So it should be fun. Yeah, speaking of of storylines, we got two, uh, you know, point streaks going head to head with Jason Robertson. He's on a tear right now. And of course, Mitch Marner, which we will be getting to in a moment. But before we do this episode of the of uh, Maple Leafs Lounge is brought to you by Morningskate.io, the daily newsletter delivered to your inbox Monday to Friday, jammed pack with the best hockey stuff on the planet. It is your daily dose of NHL news, rumors, funnies, histories, quizzes. You name it, you will get it all. Just a little hockey fun and information brought to you by the amazing staff over at the Hockey Writers. You'll see a link in the description below. And if you haven't signed up, type in your email below and you are all set to go. As we started off with the show, we kicked it off with, you know, the the point streaks by Jason Robertson. And of course, Mitch Marner put himself in Maple Leafs history with his 19 game point streak that he broke on Saturday against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Obviously, big news for Mitch. You know, there was a little bit of, you know, question marks if that streak was in doubt against the San Jose Sharks. Finally got it off his, off, uh, off his mind against the Tampa Bay Lightning, although it would have been better if it was a win. But history regardless. Alex, what do you make of this historic moment for Marner and breaking a, you know, a very not necessarily, uh, I would say probably difficult uh, streak in terms of the history books. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a tough, a tough record for him to break when you consider it's a franchise that's been around since 1917. You know, there's a lot of history in those, in, in those 105 years at this point. So for, for Mitch Marner and obviously the icing on the cake being that he was a Toronto boy, grew up a Leafs fan for him to get to set that record is, is something super special for him. And, you know, I've maintained this thinking about Marner for a long time when he's, not on his game. And we know what he's like when he's not on his game. We saw it in the series against Montreal. We saw it in, in, at the start of October, both last season and this season, he's just, he he's not fun to watch because you can tell he's in his own head and you can tell that he's, you know, he's overthinking things, which for a guy that plays the style of game that he does, he can't be overthinking anything. Having said that on the flip side, when Marner is on his game, I would go as far as to say that there is maybe three or four more play sorry, three or four players in the league that are more fun to watch than Marner. He is just unmatched when it comes to taking control of a game and controlling the cycle. And, you know, when he's, when, when he's on his game and not only, you know, playing well, but also has that confidence and the swagger to go along with it. I mean, there, there's very few things that this guy can't do. So it was, it, he's been playing like this throughout his entire point streak. And it was awesome to see him set up because um, obviously the team has his back. If you saw, he posted it on Instagram, a picture of him and the entire mm-hmm. team to celebrate the occasion. And um, you could just tell that it was something that not only him, but the, but the entire team was gunning for. And obviously he, he made, he made good with it. He set the record. Now it's a matter of how much further can he take it? So um it was definitely amazing to see him hit the mark and uh yeah sky's the limit for Marner let's see how how far he can take it yeah it's it's funny that you brought up how like when he's not on his game you you can tell that he's not on his game and based on what we've seen in the past too he gets inside his head quite a bit and as you alluded to you know he he does tend to overthink things and I think it's just the mentality of him being the Toronto hometown boy where maybe he wants to try and do too much and try and like make an impact, but sometimes it just doesn't go his way. And that affects, you know, 
or results in a turnover or a giveaway and a puck going the other way. But what's great about him right now is uh, compared to last season when he did have a poor start and everybody, including us, we were, you know, on top of Marner, you know, with him, you know, being the 10.89, whatever his contract is kind of guy, he needed to step up. And what we're seeing right now is a more confident Mitch Marner from basically from the tail end of last season into the playoffs. And now he's on top of his game. And I think maybe that series against Montreal may have had something to do with it. Maybe it was still affecting him a little bit because of, you know, how people were making him the scapegoat with some, you know, poor plays, penalties, puck over glass, you name it. But right now he's on his game and that's the most important factor right now. And our colleague, uh, you know, and, you know, co-host or main host of six in the six podcast, Andrew Forbes, did a great review on Marner's point streak and delved dive or he dwelled or dived deeper into his point streak. He um, nine goals and 26 points during that 19 game streak, a five goal game streak from November 25th to December 23rd. Only 10 of his points came on the power play, which was 53.8% of his points came at even strength. That to me, reading that from in his post, that was absolutely terrific to see that he's not, you know, relying too heavily on the power play because he's a player that does most of his damage at five on five. And if you get a chance, check out Maple Leafs, Marner's streak more about more than offensive play by Andrew Forbes. And yeah, I, I agree. I think now that he's in his, he's in his groove, he's in the zone. He's basically leading the team in points right now. Um, even when he's not playing with Austin Matthews, he's still in a league of his own. He's still one of the premier playmaking uh, wingers in the league, whether it's John Tavares or Austin Matthews, he's on top of his game. And that's the most important thing right now. Yeah. And it's just been, it's been a treat to watch. I mean, you know, like you said, when it comes to Marner, obviously when things aren't going well, it's easy to point at his contract and say, Oh, this guy's making 10.9 million. You know, he's what are, what are the Leafs paying him to mm-hmm. do? Right. And you know, all that. And on the other side of that, I think the part that kind of goes, you know, under the radar a little bit is when Marner's on his game, 10.9 million almost looks like a bargain. Oh, so yeah. it's, you know, he's, he's fortunately in the stage of his, uh, of the season right now, I hope where, you know, he's, he's kind of gotten his early season woes out of the way and he's, he's playing the way that we know that he can play. And, mm-hmm. you know, the fact that he scored two goals against Pitts or uh, sorry, against uh, Tampa, Tampa Bay was just, I was watching the game with my buddy who's a Peng- Penguins fan, so I got those <laughs> all the teams mixed up in my head. Um, but the fact that he scored two goals in that game was just icing on the cake too. And just, mm-hmm. it, it further feeds into the the notion that there's, the, there's that swagger that goes along with everything else to his game. And that's what makes him such an electric player when he's on. And even when he's shooting, he is still very lethal, despite the fact that he didn't quite utilize his shot greatly or as often as before. But then again, First 30 goal season last season, shooting the puck a bit more this time. 30 goals still is not out of the question with Mitch Marner. Moving over into our next topic. And of course, despite Mitch Marner, you know, breaking the record in that game, the Maple Leafs ended up losing in overtime once again. Looking at their schedule and the results, their record now is one and six with their last win coming back in overtime on October 20th against the Dallas Stars, who are they going to, who they're going to be playing, you know, very soon. Alex, is their play at, you know, three on three, a cause for concern? And I know we've talked about this many times before, even on the show, what needs to change with this team and the way that they approach three on three, because whatever's happening right now, it just isn't quite working. I honestly don't even know where to start with this because there's <laughs> really no clear fix to how, how to, you know, solve their woes in overtime. Mm-hmm. I, I like, I, I'd love to sit here and say, okay, they need to do this. They need to do this, but it seems like it's been something every, something different every single time. Like I would yeah. say that they didn't look awful right off the bat in the overtime against Tampa. That was just a bad goal for Matt Marie to allow. And obviously it was, there was an Austin Matthews giveaway right there, but mm-hmm. you know, how many times in the past have we seen giveaways happen in overtime and not have them lead to goals? So, you know, Matthews, yeah, he gave it away. It was bad, but Matt Murray's that that was a horrible goal for him to allow. And credit to him, he hasn't allowed many of those this season. So yeah. I think he's he deserves a bit of a, a bit of a break in that sense. But um, I think the Leafs just really need to work on playing conservatively when they when when they gain possession because in in three on three overtime, that first possession is so unbelievably important. 
because with, with, you know, only three players on either end of the ice, you've got so much time and space to work with. And, you know, it seems like in three on three, every single time there's every single time there's a zone entry, it's an odd man rush of sorts, whether it's a two on one Mm -hmm. or a breakaway or a two on O even like, it just seems like anytime the Leafs get to that point where they have possession of the puck, as soon as they cough it up, it seems like, because like how many, like, I don't know what the exact number is, but I know that a good chunk of their overtime loss this year, I want to say like four or five of them maybe have happened within the first minute of OT, Mm -hmm. which is an issue in itself because it, 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 basically the Leafs are telling teams like, Hey, if you strip us of the puck and come down and, and, and come, come into our zone and, you know, attack us on the rush and we're not going to have an answer for you. You know, whether it's a bad, whether it's an odd man rush and a hard save for the goalie to make or a stinker of a goal, like the one Murray allowed or, or just a bad giveaway leading to all that. It just, it seems like they just, they, they can't recover when they lose that first possession. So I mean, I guess at the start when I said I don't know where to like where to even begin when when it comes to dissecting this, I guess you can really just trace it back to them losing that first possession. And, you know, obviously having your goalie make a save on the on the one that Murray let in would have helped. But, you know, then what do you say for the other six overtime losses or the other five overtime losses rather? So I I really I, I don't have like a like a step one step two step three solution right here to solving mm-hmm. the Leafs overtime woes because we've seen them do amazing in overtime in the past and we know that they're capable of it they should be because they're a high octane offensive team but at the same time it seems like as soon as they lose possession it's over and I, I think they just got a way to that they got to figure out a way to either defend better in three on three OT and even if it means going back to I don't know, going back to the Mike Babcock era of starting defensive players in three on three. I mean, if you're going to plan to lose that first (laughs) possession, then you might as well have defensive players out there. But aside from that, I mean, you know, the Leafs have the star power to score an OT, you know, if you give them an odd ran odd man rush, there's a good chance they're going to score. So it's just a matter of getting themselves into that position where they can make a play like that and not succumbing immediately. And beyond that, I really don't know what the fix is. Start David Cam, Zach Aston, Reese, and Mark Giordano in overtime. Honestly, That'll probably fix it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I I honestly do think that you know, based on every single game that we've seen, it's always the result of poor puck management. Even with that Matthews like blind sight or that no look backhand pass, he was basically passing it to nobody or nobody was available. And I think that like whether it's Austin Matthews, Tavares, Mitch Marner they need to be more aware of where the play is heading. And the fact that they were already like, you know, the Tampa Bay Lightning were already, uh, you know, counteracting that and keeping them to the outside, there was going to be nobody there. And even with that soft, soft feather of a pass by Matthews, that was going to get picked off easily. And I do agree. It was a bit of a both on uh, both situations. Matt Murray definitely should have had that. Matthew shouldn't have given that puck away, but I think it all stems from puck management because that was an issue at the beginning of the season or in October when they were, you know, four, four and two, where it leads to like an odd man rush or a goal against, even though they're playing relatively well, they were playing relatively well that game until that poor puck management. And I, it's funny because two weeks ago, I wrote about how they can't keep giving up these, you know, costly points in overtime. Here we go again, you know, with another turnover, bad puck management. And it's, the, and it's a result of that. I think they just need to be more aware of what's going on. Cause I think both Matthews and Marner were along the wall. And then at the same time, he's trying to feather it to the middle of the ice. That was going to get picked off easily either, you know, maybe take that extra second and circle back and then regain the zone entry when Mar- Marner comes out and then you attack with speed. Like, you know, you should, because, you know, like you said, this is a high octane team. This is a team that can like, you know, cycle the puck round and round, especially with the speed and creativity that they have to get players out of position. And when they're in the right spot, they're going to shoot and let it rip. So I do think that if they're able to manage the puck a little bit better, then I think the points are going to come in their favor. And yes, they managed to get one every single time. I think this is the only game where they were down or they were playing well. They fought back because they weren't getting help from the referees and they managed to salvage a point, which is great. But then again, that extra point, maybe ending up costly because now you're 15, five and six where your overtime losses are probably are more than your actual losses. But you know, it, 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 overtime is, is a very funny thing. It could go either way. It's a 50, 50 battle. And like you said, whether it's a result of like, you know, a shot that just goes around and someone picks it up and it's a clear break or a bad giveaway, who knows what can happen. It, it's entertaining hockey, no matter what, but I think the Maple Leafs would like to do better and work on that a little bit more. 
Yeah, I had an unsuccessful attempt to try and get the exact number of uh, OT losses that have come in the first minute, but I couldn't <laughs> find the answer in time. So we're just going to assume that it was four or five. Some, it's, some, I, I'm pretty sure it's four out of the six losses. I would say, the, like, if we're if we're like putting money down, then that's probably a really good thing to probably yeah. probably say. And there was at least a few games where it was at least in the first minute. I think New Jersey, the Islanders obviously the Tampa Bay lightning right now. So yeah, that's definitely a big, one of the mainly the only, only concern or fix that they need to work on right now, because right now they're playing some really great hockey and if they can work on overtime that then they're going to be in a good spot. See, if you work on over, sorry, just to put in again, if you, yeah, if no. you work on overtime and practice though, then you got to wonder, is it, is it a good thing if they're scoring goals and in, in practice overtime, or is it, is it a bad thing that they're allowing goals exactly in, in, in practice? Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously they got to keep practicing in that mm-hmm. regard, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I think, I think as soon as it starts translating the games, they'll be in a much better position. Absolutely. And as we reach the, reach the midway point of our show, this show is brought to you by Sports Fan Side Hustle, a new digital course that teaches passionate sports fans how to make a lucrative side income off of their love of the game. Get off the sidelines and into the game with a course that will teach you more than 14 different and easy to start methods any sports fan Even ones with little to no experience in writing, podcasting, video production, collectibles, or marketing can use to make a steady part-time or full-time income. All you need is the internet, a computer, a passion for sports, and a few hours a week. Go to sportssidehustle.com to get the absolutely free startup guide that will explain four keys to unlocking this income opportunity. Again, that's sportssidehustle.com and get started today. Jumping into our next topic, obviously the biggest question mark heading into the season was Dubas's goalie gamble of Matt Murray and Ilya Samsonov. And again, we've talked about this. We talked about giving Matt Murray and Ilya Samsonov the chance to play and prove themselves. And boy, are they doing it right now. Um, I, I guess the main, this only question is, Alex, I know we're, you know, into the third month of the hockey season right now, but is Dubas' goalie gamble paying off big time for this team? Probably an easy one, but... Yeah, I mean, so far, it's been it's only been two months into the season, but so far, it's looking great outside of the fact that both goalies suffered an injury within the first two months. But, mm-hmm. you know, for Matt Murray, I think it was expected that he'd have an injury pop up here and there. And in Ilya Samsonov's case, I think that was his first his only real major injury, I want to say in, in a couple of years. So, you know, Samsonov's durability is not an issue. So I'm, I'm not too concerned about their durability as a unit. Um, But yeah, they've, they've looked amazing. I mean, the numbers hold up, the eye test holds up. They, they, I found that they've, they've both been really good at keeping the Leafs in games that they probably shouldn't be in. And at the same time, when the Leafs are controlling the pace of the game and they are doing really well, they're both making timely saves and keeping Mm -hmm. it that way. And, you know, I just wrote an article on this actually about how the tandem will likely dictate the ceiling that the, that the Leafs finish in this year. And when I say that, I mean, you look back to January, February, March of last season with, with Campbell and Mrazek. Campbell and Mrazek were only a tandem, like a side-by-side tandem. I want to say for a a small little stretch in January and outside of that, maybe. Yeah. And outside of that, you know, Campbell was having his struggles. Mrazek was looking okay. And then Campbell got injured and Mrazek took the crease full time, started to struggle again. And outside of, you know, outside of that, you know, Mrazek was having his injuries pop up here and there. And so there were so many games last year where the Leafs, you know, were outscoring their opponents by a ton. Like I, I was looking on hockey reference yesterday and there was a stretch of three or four games. And I want to say February or March last year where the Leafs scored at least five goals in four straight games. And simply put, they are not doing that so far this year. And that's not really an issue, I think, because we've talked about it before, how their team defense as a whole is looking better. And if you have to sacrifice a couple of goals to be better defensively as a unit, then so be it. But the bar is quite literally on the floor when it comes to goaltending in Toronto, because 
Jack Campbell and Peter Morazic were statistically two of the worst goalies in the league over that stretch from January until March. And Campbell, you don't really see it in his numbers too much because he had that Vezina month of November and a pretty good month of October as well. Mm -hmm. But when you look at them during that stretch from January, February, and March, they just could not buy a save from their goalies. I think it was like Campbell had started 17 games between uh, New Year's Day and when he got injured. If you remember, he got injured at the mm-hmm. start of March. Yeah. He started 17 games over that span. And in only six of those games, did he have a save percentage above 900? And so when you look at that, that's not good. You can't have that from your goalie. So, you know, for a Leafs team, that's that's not doing as well offensively this year and again not really an issue because they've been winning games anyways and they've been playing better defensively but if they go into a a stretch like that in this it later on in the season Murray and Samsonov can't you know really play as badly as as Morazic and Campbell did during that stretch because the Leafs aren't out here scoring five six seven goals a game so you know, I think that the goalies have both been amazing this year. And, you know, we're seeing that they've, they're, they're out playing Campbell and Edmonton and Morazic in Chicago. So the tandem has obviously been far and away better this year. Having said that it is still early and there is still time for things to change, but I'm not expecting Murray and Samsonov to maintain the numbers that they have right now all season. But if they can manage like a nine, 10, nine, 15 for most of the season, I think that's all the Leafs really need. So, you know, you, you, we, we had the discussion so many times of, oh, if the Leafs didn't throw away, you know, games to Arizona and Buffalo and Montreal, et cetera, et cetera, then, you know, maybe we're sitting here talking about them facing Washington in the first round last year instead of Tampa Bay. And, you know, it, for a Leafs team who right now they're only threatened, their only real threat in the division, I would say, is the Bruins. Um, I think that this Leafs team is good enough to win the division. And, you know, they're obviously in control of that themselves. And they've had, they'll have these games where they'll, you know, they'll start slowly. We saw it throughout October. We had like, there were times they didn't look like they didn't have an identity, et cetera. But overall, when they're playing really good hockey and when they're at the top of their game, they're they good enough to beat anybody. And if their goaltending can just at bare minimum, at bare minimum, just be average or be good enough to get the job done, then I think they're going to be, they're, they're going to be laughing towards the end of the year. But uh, yeah, it's looking like the gamble's paying off so far. Uh, still lots of hockey to go, but I, I'm loving what I'm seeing from both of those goalies early on. Yeah, and the numbers, especially at 5-on-5-2, five five if you look at natural stat trick, uh, both Samsonov and Matt Murray are in the top 15 in 5-on-5 five five save percentage, including Eric Chagrin, who did you know, post up some really good numbers in relief when both of them were out and dealing with their injuries. Uh, both Samsonov and Murray are in the top 15 in high danger save percentage and Eric Shawgren is in the top 25. But I think the biggest thing is, is with this team defense, as you know, we've seen like the odd goal go in here and there about like a bad or a poorly timed turnover. And like I said, again, puck management is going to be key with this team defense. The defense is making it very easier on them to, or is just making their job easier because before we saw how, you know, even with Frederick Anderson, Frederick Anderson was one of the top goalies that in the league that was very busy in shots against. Right now you're seeing John Gibson and Connor, ha- Connor Hellebuck, who have been the top two busiest goaltenders in the past few seasons quite a bit. They're now at the top two again. But if you scroll all the way down in that category right now, Ilya Samsonov and Matt Murray are 49th and 50th in regards to shots against at five on five with 186 and 184 respectively. That to me shows that because they're with their numbers in high, like on five on five and high danger, those are going to be really key. They're giving the team a chance to win, but the team is help is helping them out in return because that was the biggest thing last year where Jack Campbell may be, may have, uh, was standing on his head, but the de- defensive front wasn't playing well. Then there were times where the defense was playing well and Jack Campbell would let him a weak goal. We're seeing a totally different, you know, give and take situation with both the defense and goaltenders that they're helping each other out to maintain that status or to main that probability of winning a game. And if you're able to get your goaltenders to, and I agree, maybe the numbers are a little bit high and maybe it may come down to just below or around the league average where it's 915 for both. But if they're able to continue this stretch of maybe 920 save percentage, again, 
only if I'm not saying that they're going to go on the stretch. So comment section, relax. Um, <laughs> you can't get the comment section. Relax. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a- but um, you can't help but feel that this is a good positive. Cause when was the last time you had two goaltenders that were giving this kind of a performance? Never. I mean, I think maybe Frederick Anderson and Curtis McElhaney in their first year or two with the Maple Leafs. But since then, and I'm going to reiterate, this is the best goalie tandem we have seen in this new, you know, age of Matthews and Marner that we have seen. And now they're getting it and it's definitely paying off big time. To end off the show, we're going to have a little fun. Um, Usually we would have one more topic that we would go in depth, but we're going to change it up. We're going to do a little quick fire section here. And I have three talking points right now that, you know, should just be around like a 20, 30 second comment about whether or not what you think about these uh, questions. Again, it's all for fun. Um, if you need to take the extra time, go ahead because there are times where we were doing it on other shows like Prospects Corner and other shows, and we had to think about that. But hopefully, these are kind of easy questions for the quick fire. The first one, Alex, two Maple Leafs are poised to make their debut against the Dallas Stars. Connor Timmins and Semyon Der Argachinsev. I had to take a step back there for a second. Um, who are you more excited to see? SDA or, or Timmins? That's a hard question for me to answer, but I got to go Connor Timmins just because of the quote that I saw from Justin Hall today saying that he took a one-timer and it was yes. the hardest slap shot he had ever seen. And the fact that Sheldon Keyes already giving him a look on the second power play unit tells me that he's got some serious potential. So mm-hmm. Toronto boy, former first or, or former projected first round pick looking to make his debut at the Leafs. Can't go wrong. I'm looking forward to seeing Timmins, but I'm also looking forward to seeing SDA. You also forgot former Sioux boy, but that's, that's okay. Right. Former um, Sioux boy, Saint Catherine's yeah, boy too. Exactly. I I, I tend to agree. I I I have loved Connor, Connor Timmins ever since his draft year. I love his poise. I love his two way ability and his playmaking style. But then again, the Maple Leafs need more shots on the point. Connor Timmins can do that, and he's got a definite bullet of a shot. And like you said, I am excited for SDA too. Um, Looked very promising because he's got great vision and great set of hands this year. That's just been on display with the Toronto Marlies. Looked great at the rookie tournament. Looked great in uh, training camp as well. Hopefully this is a, another step for him as, you know, the Maple Leafs prospect system is starting to come up and, you know, try and graduate to the next level. And he's just another name along with Robertson, Holmberg, and possibly Matt Hollowell, who's looked pretty good as well. So, but I'm going to have to give the edge to Connor Timmons. Next question or a quick fire question is there's been a, it was just reported on Saturday that Brock Besser has been, you know, reported that he's seeking a trade out of Vancouver again, sorry to our producer, Matt. Um, Obviously the Maple Leafs are in line to possibly get a defender, get a top six forward. Do you see a fit with Brock Besser as a Maple Leafs, or are you looking for more of someone on the left-hand side as opposed to the right, but would he still be a good fit on the team? I mean, William Nylander is just as happy to play the left side as he is the right. So I don't see that being an issue. Um, I think if he's a top six forward who can score goals, I think he's someone the Leafs should be interested in. So yes, I do see a fit there. And it just so happens that the piece that the Leafs would likely have to move to clear cap space (coughs) uh, is uh, Vancouver boy. So uh, who knows? Maybe there's some life there. Obviously, some picks and prospects will have to be involved as well. But uh, I think there's a foundation there for a deal for sure. Yeah, I mean, as much as I think that maybe not if they're dead set on keeping William Nylander on the right-hand side, I mean, he is a dual positional player. He has played on the left, and that is a big, you know, reason why if they're able to get another right-hand shot on the right wing and you move Nylander over to the left, if you have Tavares, Nylander, and Besser as your line, that's pretty damn fun. I mean, he's, you know, after this season, two more years at $6.65 million. And if he's able to get back to that, you know, close to 30 goal, 30 assists range that he has in the past, because I know he's dealt with injuries and also, you know, personal issues with the loss of his father as well. If he's able to get back to that form, this is a player that can do some serious damage. And if he's going to be, you know, another playmaker slash shooting option on that second line for the Maple Leafs, you have a very, you know, potent top six right there as, as if it's not, you know, very dangerous enough as it is right now. Brock Besser definitely can be a name that could step up and be a player that can do some damage, no doubt. 
Jumping into our final question, teams are coming out with their preliminary World Junior Championship roster. That's right. The tournament that everybody loves during the Christmas break or holiday is around the corner. And obviously some surprising omissions for both Team Canada, but we're going to talk about Team USA because Ty Voigt was the only name that possibly had a chance to crack a World Junior Championship roster this year. He was not added to Team USA's camp roster. Alex, is this a big mistake on Team USA's part by not taking the top CHL or not CHL, the top OHL point producer? Yeah, I mean, if, if I think to me it just sends a clear it, it's them trying to send a clear message to their to their players coming up through the US national team system saying, "Hey, you know, we're definitely going to be favoring the guys who stick around and play college hockey, university hockey and the guys that play within our program versus the ones who go to Canada." So, um yeah, I mean, I don't have much else to say on this. It's they're obviously making a mistake. Ty Voigt's a great player. He's leading the OHL in scoring, but uh if they're willing to sacrifice that just to keep some national pride with their, with their program and their, and their college hockey players, then so be it, but it, it'll hurt them on the ice. Yeah. And if you're wondering why there's no Matthew Nyes, no Topi Niamela, it's because they turned 20 and they're not eligible for the tournament anymore. But yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, considering that they even didn't take uh, Sasha Pasajov as well, who would have been a great veteran presence on the team, because he was on that uh, USA team in August, I think it would have been a great move. And for Ty Voigt to come in with his, you know, playmaking, creativity, and high-end skill set, I thought that would have just been a welcoming addition to Team USA. But uh, again, you know, they're kind of like, you know, dead set on the college route. I don't like it. But at the same time, hey, uh, more reason for us to watch OHL hockey with Ty Voigt tearing it up and setting a career best for him as this might be his final season, but I still would have loved to see him at the World Junior Championship and represent the Maple Leafs. And that is it for this episode of the Maple Leafs Lounge. And before we end off, don't forget to sign up for MorningSkate.io, the daily dose of NHL news, rumors, histories, funnies, quizzes, you name it, all that jam-packed into a great newsletter provided by the Hockey Writer staff. Put your email in the link in the description below and you're all set to go. And don't forget, if you want to make some extra cash on the side, go to sportssidehustle.com to get started today and get a free startup guide that will explain four key ways to unlocking a great income opportunity to talk about sports on the side. Once again, that's it for this episode of the Maple Leafs Lounge. For Alex Hobson, I'm Peter Barracchini, and we'll see you next time.